Welcome back to Quantitative Analysis and Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrine, and today we're on Topic 3, Lesson 1, where we're going to talk about transforming variables. We transform variables because it allows us to change levels of measurement is one of the main things we can do. It also helps us to take variables that we have and make them more useful for us in different kinds of statistical analyses. And we're going to begin talking about statistical analyses uh, formally in a week. So, or in the next lesson rather. Um, so we're going to talk about transforming variables today. One of the most basic forms of transforming variables is called the linear transformation or an arithmetic transformation. And that's when you add or multiply or divide one variable to make it fit with another. So you're adding a constant or multiplying or dividing by a constant. It doesn't actually change anything in the variable except it'll shift the mean. Everything else will stay the same. If you add 10 to some variable, it'll shift the mean by 10. If you divide a variable by 10, it will mean that the mean, whatever it is, is divided by 10. But the standard deviation stays the same. What that allows you to do is shift a mean so that it matches some other variable better than it did uh, otherwise. That helps you really to look at uh, comparisons between those or to look at patterns between several variables, to look at, for example, histograms on the same scale, things like that. So linear transformations are really helpful when those variables are, that you're look, interested in are on different scales. Um, if one, for example, you're looking at height, you want to look at two different um, populations on height, one's in centimeters, one's in inches, you take the centimeters, multiply by 2.54, and you get that on inches. So you can compare things on different scales. If you've got one variable, which maybe is the length of uh, the hand, and then you've got another that's height, they're both in centimeters, but if you want to plot them on the same graph, the height is going to be much greater than the hand, and so that graph, the, the hand length, you're not going to be able to see because height is so big. You add or multiply hand length by some amount, you can put them on the same graph. Logarithmic transformations are quite a bit different. And what that means is that you turn some kind of a numeric scale into a logarithmic scale. And a logarithmic scale is essentially one where you're, um, where you're, you're changing a regular interval into some kind of a, of a multiplication. It's actually um, using a, an exponent, but some kind of exponent version of that scale. So you're squaring each number. Instead of having one unit of whatever the measurement is between units, you end up having the square of one unit. Um, going up. And so if you have some kind of strange uh, pattern in your original variable, you can transform it into a linear pattern. And as we'll find out next topic, linear patterns are far more useful to work with than our other strange patterns. Depending on how you do the log transform, you can take uh, an exponential pattern or um, a sine wave kind of pattern, a quadratic kind of pattern, you can, you can help shift those into a more linear scale. So this is really useful when measures have an extreme kind of change going on in them. And so here's a really good example. It's used very often. And this is what's called the rank size of cities. So what this is showing is the population of a city on this, but in terms of rank, all right? So this is the biggest city, and in this case, it's in the United States, but you can look at other areas. The biggest city is ranked one. The smallest city over here is ranked 250. So these are ranked from the biggest to the smallest cities, and then over here is their size. So this, for example, is New York City. 
I think that's uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, and it goes down to Appleton, Wisconsin. So the rank and the size. This is exponential. And that's actually really hard to deal with in a lot of analyses. So what we do is we take the log of that and we get this. And if you look, here's uh, 0, 2 to the 6th power, 4 to the 6th, 6 to the 6th, 8, uh, uh, 8. So we've got, this is uh, 2 million, 4 million, 8 million. Here we've got the log of population rank and the log of population size, so 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, those are logs. And look, it makes it straight. This is much easier to deal with. So this axis has not changed, but the population size has been turned into a logarithm, and it straightens out that distribution. And again, this is much easier to work with. So that's why we do that transformation. Another transformation that we do, and actually far more often than any kind of arithmetic or logarithmic transformation, is what's called recoding. And that's taking however a variable is already measured, and we change it. And really what we do in doing that is we change levels. Now remember, levels, we have nominal, ordinal, interval. We can change between those levels, and that's important because some levels are necessary for some kinds of statistical tests. And ordinal levels can have many more kinds of statistical analyses done with them than nominal levels. Nominal levels, we're basically left with one thing called chi-squared. Um, there's a few others that we can do, but basically chi-squared is what we can do with ordinal we can do almost anything we can do with interval data, and with interval data we can do any statistic basically that we want to. We want to have interval data. By recoding, we can take nominal data and make it kind of like ordinal data if we have an underlying theory of how things might be changing on a growth or decline or on some kind of scale in those categories that we've coded. We can take ordinal data and very easily turn that into a form of interval data. Again, if there's some sort of, of clear increase, which there should be uh, in any form of ordinal data, we can turn that into a form to mirror um, interval data. And more importantly, we can take interval data, move it to ordinal or nominal data fairly easily. So here's an example. This is from uh, a, a data set in anthropology that is very important and which we will talk about in here called uh, the standard cross-cultural sample. Um, it's not a data set, rather. It's a sample that's used widely to create data. And there's lots of data, about 2,000 variables today, available for it. This is one of those variables. This is the dependence on agriculture measured as a percentage. Now, if you look at this, we have none, non-food crops, less than 10, less than 50%, greater than 50%, and primarily agricultural. This is a, an ordinal scale. You could also see this as being nominal, uh, just categories. But it also is ordinal. And with these, we can shift this into a, maybe a different or a more useful kind of ordinal category by doing the following. We turn it into a none sum much order, and we do that by combining or recoding what we've got. So we take, for example, one and two, and we turn that into none. No agricultural dependence. We take three and four, 10, less than 10 and less than 50%, and we turn those into some contribution to agriculture, and we take 5 and 6 and to turn it into much. This is a much cleaner ordinal set. Uh, this is a scale, as it's called. 
Um, and scales are really useful to work with in analyses. They, they, they just work very well for a variety of kinds of analyses. So this is a very useful kind of recoding that you probably will do a lot of in your career as an anthropologist. We can also take this and turn it into an interval variable in the following way, and it's kind of clever. We make it dichotomous. Dichotomous variables, so present absent variables, up, down, yes, no, those things are by definition interval data because there's only one interval, so it's constant. Uh, dichotomous variables can be used in lots of interesting ways, particularly in regression and multiple regression, which we will be talking about actually next topic, we'll look at regression. Um, so these can be really useful to do this when you have something like an ordinal or a nominal variable. And let's think if this was nominal and we have these various categories, um, we can shift this in the following way. We take none and non-food crops, we say that's absent, agriculture is absent. And then we have any amount of agriculture, we say it's present. Now we've got an interval variable from what could be nominal or ordinal in this case, uh, and that is very useful for us. So recoding is something we're going to do a lot. One of the things in recoding that we uh, will do a lot of is changing variables into a different order. And we can have an underlying theory of how categories change in some regular direction, and then we can take a nominal variable, shift those categories around, and have sort of a mock or a, a, a theoretically based ordinal variable. We're going to do that a lot. Um, because we are anthropologists and we deal with nominal and ordinal data a lot, as you'll see, recoding is really useful and important. Okay, let's take a short break. We'll be right back. And we are back. So we're going to move on now to one of the key topics in this lesson, if not the key topic, and actually a key topic in this entire topic which is standardizing variables. What we've talked about so far in this lesson has been changing variables so that two, two variables are on similar scales or that we have variables in a form that we want them for whatever analyses we're going to do. It's pretty clear, I think, why we want to do that. But I want to talk a little bit more conceptually about this. And again, in this course, I want us to be thinking conceptually and visually about statistics. All right, and we'll get visual in here in a moment. Conceptually, the kind of anthropology that statistics work best for is for explaining variation. If you remember, we've talked about this, we'll continue to talk about this. When we look at variation, descriptive statistics are great. But to explain and really understand variation, we're going to end up having to look at multiple variables at the same time. And we're going to be talking about how one variable, or variation in one trait, is associated with variation in another trait, or even can predict or explain variation in another trait. To do that, we have to have those traits in some format that they really are comparable, that they can work together. And what we do in order to achieve that is standardize them. We can use mathematical, logarithmic, or recoding transformations to put them in formats where they're comparable, but standardizing them is what really makes two variables comparable so that they work together in an analysis. Okay, what are we doing? So that really is, it allows us to compare and work with variables together 
when they're on very different forms of measurement, really so that we can measure apples and oranges. And I'll show you why this is important. One of the other things it does is that it absolutely turns an ordinal variable into an interval variable. And you can sort of play with the idea that it can turn a nominal variable into an interval variable, but that's a, that's a, a stretch and, and unusual. Really what you're talking about is a nominal variable that has an underlying linear or an ordinal scale to it. So let's look at this. The way we do this is to transform a value or a score or a code on a variable. Value is obvious, right? And score on a variable, how you count a variable. Coding, we're going to talk about in another lesson, and that's really what we're getting at here. But to transform a score or value on a variable into what's called a z-score. And I actually don't know why it's called a z-score, but it just is a z-score. Or it can be called a standardized score. This is the formula for a z-score. Again, we're only having a few formulas in here. We're going to only, only have maybe two or three more in this entire course. But here's one of them, a z-score. We're doing x minus x bar. See that all the time, right? So that should be something that doesn't frighten you anymore. A, a particular variable score minus the mean. And I just want to point out standard deviation, mean, standard deviation, and z-scores are three things that you need to understand completely so that you're familiar with them. When you hear the term, you know exactly what's being talked about. Those are three things in these first three topics that you need to understand completely, be completely comfortable with before moving on to topic four and any of the other topics in the class. So z-score is the difference from any given case from the mean divided by the standard deviation. All right, this is just a ratio, right? So if this score and that score are the same, we have zero divided by zero or by some amount, that ends up being zero, right? If we divide by zero, it's infinity. We don't want to do that. But standard deviation is always something. If you don't have, if you have zero standard deviation, you don't have a variable because it doesn't vary. You have a constant. So you, all the z-scores are the same. You don't have anything. You got zero divided by zero anyway. That's going to be zero. Anyhow, let's say the mean of a of a variable is 2, we have a score of 1, 1 minus 2 is minus 1, divided by, oh, let's say the standard deviation is uh, 0.5, we get negative 2, right? 2.5s in, or sorry, negative 1 half. Two, 1 minus 2 minus 1 over 0.5, sorry, is 2. See, even I don't do math well, but I can understand statistics. That would be 2, it would be minus 2. So in this case, it's not like standard deviation where we square it and we get a positive value uh, in terms of the variance, right? Squared, we get the variance, square root it, we get the standard deviation, remember all that? You should be able to remember all that. It's important. We get the standard deviation. It's a positive number. Here, though, we can get a negative number. So uh, just remember that. Z-scores can range from negative anything to positive anything. OK. So let's think about this a little bit. This is just a ratio for how much this case differs from the mean in terms of the standard deviation. What's the ratio between this difference and the standard deviation? If they're the same, it's 1. If it's greater, then it's going to be more than 1. If it's less, it's going to be less than 1. And it can be negative or positive. Okay, one of the key things 
in this, and one of the reasons that this is standardizing them, is that this is just the same thing, right? You're doing the same mathematical uh, activity to all of the variables, and so you always end up with a score that ranges between negative something, positive something, and in the middle is zero. So it's standardized. You have, uh, you have a distribution that has zero as the mean, and then you have a range of values around it. And it tends to do a relatively good job, this does, of making a skewed distribution a little bit more normal. Uh, not completely normal, but it helps really deal with that. Okay, the other important thing is if we have these as apples, we have a mean in apples, a uh, case in apples, and a standard deviation in apples. Apples over apples cancel out when we have a dimensionless variable. And that means we can literally compare apples and oranges because we no longer have apples or oranges, we just have fruits or something. They're dimensionless. We can look at one measure in centimeters and the other measure in feet. They cancel out and we're just looking at z-scores. They're standardized, there's no dimension. So there, this is extremely useful uh, to provide an opportunity for comparing things. So what's the relationship between z-score and standard deviation? Well, you know what, they're essentially the same kind of thing. Uh, if we have a distribution with the mean at zero and a standard deviation of one, z-scores are going to be exactly the same. So we can, you can think of these as being really similar things, but what happens when you deal with a z-score is, again, you get this dimensionless number, uh, and, and that's really useful for comparison. But you can think of them as sort of similar things, and I think that helps conceptually for you to think about z-scores. Okay. Here's happy me. Happy me on this distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. If I'm at minus one standard deviations, that also means I'm at minus one z-score. Here's an interesting thing then that we can do with this. By placing cases on a, a, a distribution with a z-score is this. Let's begin with thinking about up here this being some measure of happiness. We have some psychological measure of happiness, someone who's happy, someone who's not. So here's happy me. I'm up here with a z-score of about one point. 7, 1.8. Sad me is over here with a z-score of minus 2.5. So sad me and happy me score very different on this variable which has to do with happiness. So we might want to think about, okay, what can explain happiness? What might be a thing that leads to happiness? And let's say it's the number of donuts somebody eats every week because we all know that the amount of happiness in the world is directly proportional to the number of donuts in the world. So we'll look at these and here's our scores. Here's happy me a little bit higher on the z-score maybe one half. Here's sad me maybe minus 0.2 but if you remember we have percentages in here and the same thing happens with z-scores as with standard deviations because they're sort of equivalent. We have 68% of, of the population between 1 and minus 1 z-scores. So in fact, while we score really differently on happiness, because that's what happy me and sad me differ on, we're basically in the core middle part of the population on number of donuts eaten per week. So, right? All right. Let's look at another variable. Maybe participation in religion 
predicts happiness. So let's look at the number of times that a person goes to church in a month. And doesn't want, there we go. So here's happy me and sad me. Well, look, we both fall within this middle part again. So in terms of donuts eaten and number of times going to church, we don't really differ. We differ a lot in happiness, but not in those. So we could say those probably aren't related that much to happiness. Well, what if we move on to something else and we say the number of friends that you have. Okay, here's happy me and sad me. So happy me is right in the middle. Doesn't differ from most of the population, but sad me, surprisingly, in terms of this, um, tends to have more friends. I don't know what would explain that, but it might have something to do with, I don't know, there's more conflict you deal with, more stress in your life. We, this is just, I'm making up these things as I go along. This is not planned, and it's just an example. This would suggest, well, maybe whatever that is, the number of friends, let's actually do something different because it'll make sense. The number of drinks you have in a week because drinking is bad. Well, social drinking every now and then isn't bad, but being an alcoholic, bad. Don't do it. Um, Number of drinks you have makes you sad, and it really does. So, number of drinks you have. Happy me is normal. Doesn't predict happiness necessarily, but it does really look like there's some association with number of drinks and sadness. That's sort of what I'm talking about in being able to compare things, because here we've compared number of donuts you eat, number of times you go to church, and number of drinks you have, those are all totally different things. Yet with z-scores, we can measure them equivalently because we have dimensionless scores now, and they're all on the sc same scale. Let's talk about this again then. Here's silly me, really happy. Z-scores really happy on the happiness scale. Well, where does silly me score in terms of donuts? Ah, oh, right in the middle again. All right, donuts don't seem to be associated with happiness or sadness. Oh, look. Number of times you go to church doesn't seem to be related to happiness or sadness. Everybody is right up there in the middle. Ooh. Happy silly me doesn't drink hardly at all. And they're really happy. Now we've got sort of more evidence here that this variable, and again, I'm just saying drinking because drinking too much is something you don't want to do. If you don't drink that much, you're happier than if you drink a whole lot on this variable. That's what we're going to be doing with z-scores. And they're going to be used in lots of kinds of analyses we do, or at least this concept of comparing variables on a similar uh, scale is going to be used a lot. So it's something you really need to understand. Okay, so we're done with z-scores, and I want to reiterate, don't drink, okay. I want to reiterate that at this point, you need to be very, very comfortable with the concept of mean, with the concept of standard deviation, and then with the concept of standardized scores, or z-scores. By the end of this topic, you need that in order to move on. If you don't understand that, go back and look at some of the lectures again and, and, and make sure you get comfortable with it. Okay. That's all for now. See you next time.